Karen Stevens of Karen Stevens Dance, or KSD for short, is someone who I deeply admire. That has been true for a very long while. In fact, she was on my first list of potential guests when I first started this podcast, and I'm so glad that the time and the scheduling and all of it has aligned today for you to listen to this conversation. She and I got started in the Seattle art music scenes at about the same time, and we worked on a project together that became something really wonderful for both of us separately, and then also together. It's really wonderful. I know you will really appreciate how caring and thoughtful and eloquently Karen speaks about some of these subjects that we cover today. We cover what it means to forge a career for yourself, how to dance with the dark side of making art, what it means to value yourself when things aren't going as well as they could be going, and why movement is so important for the world. Physical body movement and just general metaphorical movement too. If you ever have had those really powerful internal dialogues of that kind of went like, what does all of this mean and why am I even doing this? Then this is the episode for you. <laughs> As always, links to the things Karin and I mentioned are in the show notes for this episode over at barenakedbravery.com. And Karin is already in our Bare Naked Bravery Facebook group. So if you've got follow-up questions, go for it in there. She and I already have plans to make a follow-up episode for you. So keep your ears to the ground for that. However, today we have a conversation that I know you will fully drink and drink deeply from. Karin's story contains things that we all go through. You're listening to Bare Naked Bravery, a weekly podcast hosted by me, Emily Ann Peterson. As a singer, songwriter, author, teaching artist, and creative entrepreneur, I encounter some really fascinating stories. I'm on a mission to reveal the depth and width of bravery and its benefits to creatives like yourself. More than ever today, our world needs bravery, unique bravery from everyone. This is the place where you find it. There is no script or censorship today because that's how these facets of bare naked bravery are in real life. So if you're listening with little ears nearby, please know that some episodes may contain mature language and subject matter. One of the easiest ways you can share bravery with the world is to send this episode to a friend or two. Send them an email, text, or tweet. Tag them in one of my Instagram posts. My handle is Emily Ann Pete. Or leave us a review on iTunes. It takes seconds and can be done from your phone right now. Again, we need more bravery in the world. So let's be brave together. Karen, I'm really excited for this. Yeah. Uh, we, we were just talking a little bit about what we were going to talk about in public with the recording button going. And I'm really excited about all of these subjects that we've got on the docket. So um, I think we should start with how we first met. Yeah. And I'll let you, I'll let you talk about it. <laughs> I was back in Seattle putting up my first show and... I had an old friend that I had done my very first show out of college many years before, um, who is a cellist and a phenomenal composer, but he wanted to do something with his cello and suggested the Bach cello suite in G major. And at that time, I would not have chosen that work, but I followed it. And being the guy that he is, it's Phil Peterson. He's in Seattle, very talented man. He had something come up that required him to be at something probably that paid him a lot more than the gig that we were doing. But I was in the middle of working on this. And it was one of those situations that happens often and over and over again is following something that is pulling you or pushing you and needing to be true to it, regardless of all the feelings around it. And I can't remember, you had come and started to work in the space that I was, I had a trade with at that time um, Mm -hmm. to get free rehearsal space and get my work going in Seattle and you are a cellist. And so we began working on that project together. You jumped right in and it was a really beautiful time and a beautiful space. 
working. We actually worked together, which is rare. We got to be in the space together, working on that suite and talking about the suite and creating the movement. It was really fun. It was really fun. It was my first time working with someone outside, someone, or I should say, it's my first time collaborating with somebody that wasn't a musician. Hmm. And that was really fun for me. So random fact, did you know that Phil Peterson just did strings for Taylor Swift's new new track? (laughs) He's always doing all kinds of incredible things. I've worked with amazing musicians. I'm, I'm really proud of the people that I've gotten to work with over the years. Yeah. That's been a passion of mine. I think it's because that was the love language that I had with my dad. He always had classical music playing and it was, and he, we were always moving together. We didn't talk much, but we were, he would be gardening or sailing or driving through the streets of our neighborhood with the windows down and the Marine Corps marching band going. And I've always had a commitment to working with music. I mean, well, I think people would say, duh, you know, music and dance, but I was really interested in the deeper relationships of working with people. And that has been a huge gift to the work that I've been doing and continue to work with amazing people. Last year, I got to work with Paul Rucker, Ah. a beloved person in Seattle and also by Coastal Now. And he, in fact, he encouraged me. This this is a a lovely moment. I just want to slip in there. I have not had a lot of success yet with grants and the bigger support. And he leaned over and said, it's not announced officially yet, but I want to say it to you. And the dancers are dancing and we're watching this project last winter. And he said, I think it was 12 or 13 or 14 years I applied while I finally got the Guggenheim. And he did finally announce it a couple months later, but I mean, yeah, Wayne Horvitz worked with in Seattle. So, I mean, let's talk a little bit about, for those of us, for those of us, including myself, who are not very familiar with the traditional, like, how does dance do its thing? It's one thing to know how to dance versus feeling like you have two left feet, but it's also another thing to operate in the realm of dance, like the industry of dance, if we call it an industry, you know, like, what is it like to try to get something up? and going from the ground up and start something on your own, as opposed to jump in on something else that's already going. Goodness. I feel like I almost have to come in a circuitous route to that question. Sure. I mean, there's different aspects of the dance world. I, I mean, I think using industry is an appropriate word for certain aspects. And we even see dance is more popular now because we see it in, on TV. And then there's the aspect of the ballet world. And then there's my world, which is in the lineage of modern and postmodern dance and was built on the backs of incredible humans, primarily women, especially in America in the beginning, Martha Graham and Isidore Duncan, Ruth St. Dennis. They, they had a vision for a new movement and it encompassed more than just this an art form, but a whole philosophy of changing and evolving as humans. So throughout the last more than a hundred years, these individuals simply carved out a place for themselves in the world and for this art form from nothing, uh, no money, no audience. In some ways, <laughs> they're the wandering prophet in, you know, in the <laughs> wilderness and, and they goes all the way through the century. And um, even today continues to be developed by these um, original voices through movement. So it's, it's still an underdog, uh, the lineage that I'm in, in terms of understanding about this art form in terms of a larger audience, a greater societal, cultural appreciation for this art form. Um, People tend to know more about um, and appreciate ballet, which is understandable, but it's rich. And I'm glad to continue to be a part of this and carry the torch alongside others in this nation, in this city. So it's not easy. (laughs) All that said, uh, it's very countercultural. It is not economically viable. It doesn't fit into the machine of the, you know, industrial and economic movement. And it's not straight entertainment. No, it's, and it's, it's not actually, it's not about entertainment. Um, It's Mm -hmm. about, at least for me, it's about deeper questions of why we move. What is our movement? What is the movement from these imperfect bodies in contrast to, uh, you know, say classical dance, which is built upon these otherworldly bodies that do these amazing things that take us to places sort of beyond our everyday existence. And so I actually I could get into a whole nother side, the philosophy side that's really become important to me, but you asked a specific question about what does it take to do this? So there are avenues to um, 
gain support and exposure for your work. Um, today, our city has a, a lovely community and um, a couple centers for, we have a hub, Velocity Dance, uh, for contemporary dance. We have a hub for performance arts at, um, on the boards. And there are all kinds of festivals, even on the east side, that have been going for a while. And you can apply. And There's the International Dance Festival that was started about 10 years ago. And there aren't a lot of great venues for dance, but uh, you know, you, affordable venues are around. Velocity is built a place where you can get your work started. When I started, um, Velocity was going through a really difficult time, which we're still going through that difficult time having to do with um, increase in rent and how mm-hmm. you know space is, who owns that space and gets to say what happens with the space. So I was at the Fremont Abbey at the time and they were supporting artists and um, so I did a trade for my space and that's where I got started because Velocity was going through a really scary time. And, and, and then eventually I made my way to being supported at their space as an anchor tenant. But as far as, let me just finish that up. I actually didn't have a lot of success in the routes of trying to get exposure through all the different various opportunities. And some I did apply to, some I didn't. Part of it was I was also a mother and I didn't have endless amounts of time or opportunities to, to give to this. I had very specific hours and ways in which I had to hunker down and honestly sequester myself away to really make this happen. And obviously it's lonely, I think for all artists, but I think in many ways there were times where it was maybe more lonely and maybe I was disconnected from the greater Seattle community and and the dance community than I would have liked to have been, but it's tricky. It's just a tricky path. And it still remains today, even though, you know, it's been eight years since that first show that we did together, Emily. (laughs) Yeah. And I think, but I think that that balance between when, when is it okay to sequester yourself to get work done? And when does that damage your career or your personhood? Because sometimes that isolation is not actually helpful for your art, nor is it helpful for your like mental health. (laughs) I mean, at least that's what my experience has been that like, I love to go and do all of this wonderful, crazy, cool stuff, but it's hard to, it's hard to still build that community in spite of all of that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and I, I love the idea I'm of being, you know, alone and working on projects and, but, you know, I actually ultimately have to work with people. And um, so it wasn't so much sequestering away from all people. It was just not quite being connected to the avenues that lead to more exposure to audience in this area and then perhaps to a national stage. Yeah. So that's just a tough, it's a tough walk. So I just kept plugging away. I start, I mean, the biggest thing is funding and it always is. And for any nonprofit, even at the highest levels. (laughs) And I started, I have a husband who is, has always had to raise money for various reasons and then has been in the business of inter intrapersonal relations. He has a high intelligence in that area and um, working in sales and learning what it means to be fearless and ask and sell your story. And so I just started that around the time we met back in 2009, I started reaching out to friends and family and slowly building this fundraising aspect to think that you get this area really well. And um, obviously culture has shifted and we have more understanding about that um, through, uh, you know, Kickstarter and Hatch Fund, all these different ways of raising money. And I think we need to go further with that even. And I hope that at some point um, what I've learned and what I'm doing uh, builds upon this, these new possible sustainable systems of how we support the arts because government, I don't think is going to come around ever. (laughs) I mean, we, we are like 40 cents or something, um, taxpayer dollar in support for the arts in our country versus, you know, there are European and Asian countries that support the arts through taxpayer money upwards between 20 and 40. If we say it in dollars, I read that from an Mm -hmm. article that was talking about support of the arts back when that terrible fire happened in Oakland and we lost those artists. Um, so there's a lot to this conversation, Emily, that we can different directions totally. we can go in. Oh my gosh. Um, so I, I'm trying to build a new, uh, you know, I'm, I even, I, we haven't, well, I already, we talked about our collaboration. So collaboration has been huge and that is where I found, I, I think that's why I appreciate the music component to my work because the collaborative relational side, we're meant to be relational. It's something I believe about us as humans. And that has been a really beautiful thing um, for 
my work personally and building these relationships with these p- different people I've worked with over the years. Some have become really good friends, like you, for example. But there's also this sense in which uh, there's been this top-down hierarchy in terms of how art gets produced and and recognized and flourished. And, and so, you know, I was thinking, <laughs> I'm small, but I guess in some ways I'm the top of this organization, KSD. Mm-hmm. But how can it spread on this horizontal level? So how I haven't completely had the luxury of giving a lot of money to a composer, but, you know, as that grows, how can they be in relationship with me and raising money? And so most recently I've launched a new fundraising platform um, through Network for the Good, and it has the ability to create pages where uh, they could actually fundraise to their friends and family as well to support know, the creation of this new music they're making for this project for um, KSD. And on a small level, I've seen it with dancers. Their families have come into supporting the work um, in various projects and over the years. And that's just a really beautiful thing that they get and see, wow, I can directly support my artist offspring. (laughs) We have to start. I mean, that's the big message here, I think, is, you know, Seattle is one of the wealthiest cities in in the United States. And as most people know if they listen to the news, we have, I think it's the worst homelessness problem in yeah. the nation. And that trickles down to our artists. I have friends directly affected in terms of home and housing and affordability. Although I don't know any artists that are homeless, I know they have been homeless at moments. <laughs> so we are in a crisis in all kinds of ways. And uh, the fact that it's with our art says something. I think, you know, uh, it's also like all that much more important. Like, even if we have given up, even if you have given up hope in government helping the arts, it still makes it all that much more important to vote locally because some of these like zoning laws are squeezing artists out of their rent. Like they, or, or some of these venues that are hold these beautiful shows that you and I have seen these venues are gripping on to their leases for dear life. Yeah. Some of them are gone and some are worried. Yeah. But it's one of those, it's all that much more important for lovers of the art to yes, financially donate and financially support, but also support them politically as well. Like making sure that your vote actually supports the people around you is so important. At least yeah. in the U.S., you know. Yeah. And I think supporting the arts with your money, too, is a political action as well. Yes, it definitely is. And I mean, whether it's on a small scale of getting behind a friend and buying a painting or finding out who's doing work. Um, there's a wonderful film in Seattle about our water region and indigenous uh, issues as well. And um, Tracy Rector. Sorry, I was trying to draw her name in. I mean, there's do some research and find out what projects are out there that need more funding. Mm -hmm. That would be an encouragement to people and look in your own areas and find out. I mean, artists tend to really care about the big issues. They they tend to be the ones ringing the bells and, 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 and calling out problems before the rest, before everyone else sees it. And, you know, we live in a great city, Seattle, where there's a lot of people already aware, but even in our own city, well, I think that that's what makes us light bringers, you know, like I, I think that sounds so hoity toity to <laughs> call myself a light bringer, but you know, if we are, I hope that I'm doing that. There's a lot of purpose for art, but uh, there's a lot of reasons for art and it doesn't have to just be light bringing, but that's something that is important to me to there's, I mean, I say the grief and the grandeur of our humanity moving from this imperfect body, we have to we have to acknowledge the suffering and we have to move in ways through that and with that towards something, something more, something healing, something loving, something more connecting, something changing, transfiguring. Yeah. I'm right there with you. (sighs) Man, we, we dove deep. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about some of what it's like to forge a career for yourself as an artist, I mean, we, we kind of talked about like the, the environmental, like the landscape, but what is it, what have you learned about forging a career for yourself that looks kind of different than some of the other traditional ways? Oh, 
Well, I laugh because economically, this does not look like a career that you forge for yourself on a personal level. <laughs> and I've struggled with that. I struggle with that. I still struggle with that. And that's the ego coming in. And, you know, that's the, the, fem- the feminist in me coming in. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. I mean, what is it that, because I know, like, I also deal with the same things mm-hmm. that, you know, when you think, well, I'm in a, I'm in an industry or an industry that's quote unquote crumpling. This music industry is like tanking. How do you keep going? And what does it mean to value yourself? Yeah, and how yeah. do you find these contracts with venues and still value yourself, <laughs> but still try to yeah. get as much exposure as you can? And what have you learned about navigating the, that like sense of self-valuing yeah. I mean, there's so much, there's so many, so much to say, so many different avenues. I'm sorry to, trying to just let it move through me. The right things to say at this moment or the, um, the most pertinent thing to say in this discussion. I think I can, I can only speak personally around the, the unique parts of my story, which are, you know, I also have been a mother for a long time and I have three children and I have a partner And the partner has been, he's been in this with me from the very beginning in terms of committing to art and making art. And through the journey of, you know, for my, my story has been a deep, 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 painful questioning of, am I really, is this really what I'm gifted at? Is this really, if I'm, if I'm, you know, made whatever you're, theological or philosophical ideas are around why we're here on this earth. You know, if, if we're, if I'm made to do this work you know, to make art through movement, you know, they're just, that has been an up and down journey for me and um, deeply painful at moments and deeply confusing. And in times I've tried to get off the train track of this trajectory because I couldn't tell for sure because it, it doesn't, it hasn't come easily and it hasn't, not that anything comes easily or anything should, but I've forged my own way. I mean, I've been pretty much independently, I've pretty much independently produced everything that I've done. I've had a few sort of commissions with, you know, works with a theater or um, there's a symphony in Montana that I know through some family that has commissioned me. Um, but really I've been on my own creating this and there hasn't been necessarily outside of some really beautiful friends that just keep whispering, go, keep going. You know, we believe in you. We believe in this. This, this means something to us. This, you know, this impacts our lives. I, I've had a lot more demon voices. And my friend, just recently, a friend of mine, she's an amazing person, Stephanie Drury. She, she's got a voice out there on the world calling against some other things in a creative way. And but she said to me, can you imagine those like onion statements, like the onion paper? But there's, <laughs> there's just been some louder voices telling me that I'm unlikable, unlovable. And, you know, the work is not, is insignificant to this world. And, um, and I think a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah. And I don't want to say I'm, you know, I don't want to claim as a prize in that kind of way that mine has been worse than others, but I think I can fairly say it's, it's been pretty deep. <laughs> I mean, what, what do you mean by, by that? I mean, how has that affected you other than just internally that struggle? How has that affected your career or your family or? Well, I think, you know, people have said to me that I have a, someone said to me recently, they feel that I'm fearless or courageous. I had even the director of the center where I'm an acre tenant. She said, she called me a powerhouse and a card for my birthday last year. And and I don't feel like that <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> Although I was interesting, interested in you constantly talking about bravery and courage. I did look up the words and courage is about heart, the word core, the French connection and bravery. One thing I looked up was sort of this, this like, you know, you picture a big soldier with, you know, armory and just goes at it and just does it. And I would say that less than the big soldier, it was, it was a lot of having to move through this sense of grief around things, around my life, around how I felt toward me or my work and having to trust. Sometimes it was also, I just had already gotten my way into things and needed to keep finishing them. Um, There was a time where back in 2012, where I, I went through some painful things around producing a show and having eight people in the audience and getting this 
review that really hurt and yada, 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 stupid things. But, um, and the anxiety, I guess the constant bounce between depression and anxiety that I've had that I can identify back to when I was a child, actually, I wanted off that. And I thought this doesn't make sense, you know, and that would be the thing I would say to people in the world. If, you know, it's one thing, I mean, I think women especially have had to have a lot of fortitude and fearlessness and courage because we faced (laughs) so, so much historically that we can pull our boots up and just keep going, but it sacrifices a quality of health, of well-being. And here I was, you know, into my late thirties at that point, and I have a beautiful family and I had a partner that loves me and I love him and we're creating a beautiful life. And I'm trying to do something that can be beautiful and should be, but it's causing me so much pain. And so um, there have been a couple chapters where I've had to redirect and, and either retreat and move differently. And so at that point, I stepped back and determined, you know, I want to get out from underneath this and really, truly understand what this is about. Because I had mentally, I understood, but physically. And so that's been, but, you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll say this. I really believe that it isn't really about the things we do, the, the, the careers we have or the, you know, the ideas we come up with and execute. It's really about something about humanity and something more deeply metaphysical or spiritual, philosophical about, you know, learning things and becoming things that matter more. Like humility really, really matters. I think it is one of the most important things and and love really, really, really matters. So I realized I I wanted to have health and well-being and I, I really didn't care anymore there were a lot of years of, you know, I want to be something, I want to do something in this world and, and for the good. But then it, even that didn't matter. It's like, I just want to live a, a, a life that resonates humility, love, beauty. And so I got off the bandwagon for a minute. And, but you know what? I clearly through that time realized I also had to be true to this authentic self and deep down underneath the noise, the authentic self is in the dance for me. Mm -hmm. But if I hadn't gone from the journey, I mean, that's the thing with suffering and pain. And I wouldn't have gotten closer to this deeper aspect of where I really stand, which is this philosophy in believing that our bodies are the source of, of knowledge, of evolution, of healing, of connecting, of loving, that movement itself is all of life. And so after 2012, actually, I knew I had to crawl my way back through it again. And I was working the first thing that actually, that's an interesting thing. Another conversation we can go into the sort of things you set out to do first that don't really happen, but the things that just kind of the river just keeps moving and things just keep happening and keep ending in places that you hadn't quite imagined and that you're doing this work and you're, it's letting go of, you know, focusing on, well, what, look what they're doing or what they have, or oh, shouldn't I be doing that and trusting and doing the work that's in front of you. And so anyways, I had this solo project that came to me and <laughs> backstory during that solo that I did with you, that was, that was really hard because I didn't really believe in myself as a solo performer. So here I am doing another solo that somebody asked me to do, hired me to do, and I'm in the studio and I have this vision of, you know, there's got to be more scholarship out there around this form of movement that I've been a part of um, from the early women. And lo and behold, I went home that day and there was, I did a little Google search and I found this woman, Kimmer Lamote, and she has written extensively, but most recently a book that's called Why We Dance. And what was so wonderful is through 12, 13, 14, 15, actually she hadn't published that book yet, but uh, some other books of hers I was reading. I was coming into this experience, understanding deeply through my own experience and my intuition that movement matters uh, of the utmost. It is absolutely everything. I, it is It is what creates matter. It is our evolution. It is our knowledge. And here she took all, and I thought at this time, right before that book came out, I'm kind of jumping forward a couple more years. How can I communicate this? Because really this is just my lonely, (laughs) my lonely sequestered moment when I am in the studio all by myself, or I am seeking to overcome, you know, pain or seeking to get ideas. And I go for my walk or I go for a movement practice. Suddenly I find this 
hardcore scholarship in this woman's book. And then we became friends. And so there is the beautiful part of the journey that are, and I'm kind of jumping to a new place, going back to other questions of yours, but that it isn't always career. So you said career, (laughs) my career isn't necessarily yet awards and tons of financial support or touring or big audience watching this work that I care deeply about. And I really want them to be moved by this artwork that I've created or the things that I say around it. It's, it's, it's been these other magical, miraculous places that are, are smaller and, and beautiful. Like that story of, of journeying through the deep, the deeper places of what it means to be a human in this body today and you know, my body and the relationships. And then also the magic of finding this incredible scholar and philosopher who's now my friend. And then there are so many stories of little things like, you know, one of my first, oh my gosh, Emily, this is great. So, (laughs) you know, that Bach cello suite that we did Uh that I, you know, the whole time we're creating it, I'm having to battle back thinking that, you know, I'm a worm while performing this solo. And also that, you know, uh, stupid thoughts like this just isn't cool enough to be working on a box cello suite, right? Like the opening movement is gorgeous, but it's in, you know, car commercials. And, um, uh, you know, that's nothing innovative, right? That word gets thrown around all the time. I have lots to say about that word innovative as applied to art. But, um, and that actually was the trigger for this maestro in Montana that then the whole, that became this whole Bach to the 21st century program I did but I'm getting to the point, I took that solo and I created into a group work, the Bach cello suite. And I'm sitting in Montana in the audience. I had just had my third kid. So I didn't, she was like three months old. And so I, I didn't, I didn't put the pressure on myself to jump in dancing that quickly. Although I might've been able to, but, um, <laughs> and this woman sitting next to me realized that, that I had made this work at intermission. And she specifically said, she looked at me and said, six weeks ago, I almost died. I went off the cliff somewhere in Montana and, you know, a branch went through my window and both she and her dog lived. And, um, she said, and I thought while I was watching this box cello suite and it was the chief, it was the opening movement, the prelude. And, uh, I had it in a trio and, and, you know, I, I never thought that was a great work that I created, but she said, and I thought while I was watching it, I could have missed this. <laughs> And it was just this really profound moment. Although I have to, oh, that makes I, me cry. It is beautiful, but I want to, I want to bring some, um, you know, gravity, like, gravity to this. At the same time, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the second half, there was a woman who wouldn't clap, and her husband like elbowed her and said, "Why are you clapping?" She's like, "I don't have to clap if I don't like something." So I mean, and that's just sort of the life of being in the arts. Maybe it's the life of being in all of life. That there, yeah, it's all of life. I mean, there's the profound moments and then there's the haters. And so it's getting more and more toward the beauty. I mean, we're looking at it politically. So how do we, you know, there's so much to look at that is just, oh, so awful and ugly and, and worse than that. There's not enough words to say. But there are those moments that will make you cry. Like you just, I I just, my, I'm tearing up. Like it's (laughs) that, like the giving somebody the gift of, that thought like I could have missed this or I'm so glad I didn't miss this. Yeah. That's, uh, artists can have some pretty intense ups and downs. And I know I'm not the only one who's experienced this, but that roller coaster is not so scary when you have patrons to join you for the ride. In fact, patrons can actually make bravery feel fun. (laughs) For the last several years, making art and music and even this very podcast has been fun the entire time because I've had a loyal group of patrons who love what I do and want to see me to continue to do it month after month. I am so proud to call these people patrons. They are brave souls whose advice and encouragement I seek out at every turn that I can. My patrons are the ones that that get to hear the songs before I record them. They get to hear the songs before they're finished. They get to request cover songs from me and they get the behind the scenes videos from some of my rehearsals too. And they are the ones I reach out to when I'm choosing album art and making decisions about my artistic future because I really do value their opinions. 
I've written songs to honor them. I've grieved with them. And together we have made really beautiful things. If you are interested in becoming a patron of mine, then I invite you to go to barenakedbravery.com forward slash patron, P-A-T-R-O-N to learn more. And no, you don't have to have a lot of money to become a patron of mine. You can join their ranks for as little as a dollar a month. And we would love to have you along for the ride. Let me tell you this, it is a ride worth taking. In my own journey, I have my own little things that have yeah. Tell me spurred me. I on, mean, there's so many. Know. Tell me what's an example well, of you because we haven't worked closely together in years, and you've been on the singer songwriting journey, and I love what you've done. And some of your songs are so beautiful. Thank you. One of the things that I've done is, you know, in anticipation of the next album that oh, just dropped my pen, um, in anticipation of the next album that I've got coming out, I created this like blank journal, which will be one of the pieces of merchandise for the album, but it's got my lyrics in squeezed into the, this blank book. Right. And I took the first proof of that book and brought it with me on all of my shows from this last couple years and used it as kind of a guest book. So like passed the book around and said, Hey, write a letter to write a note or a letter to either me or to someone else who's going to watch a show in the future. And so that's been really cool to see people writing letters. Like there was one person who wrote a passive aggressive note to the person sitting in front of her (gasps) who was using her camera, her video camera too much. She was like, (laughs) the note in the book was like, dear person sitting in front of me. I know you think Emily's amazing because she is. However, I would really love it if you put your phone down (laughs) because I could pay attention to what was actually happening. Stuff like that. That's hilarious. But then there was one day where I was flipping through it because some people leave their email addresses in the book and I add them to my list. Uh So I was looking for email addresses in this book and I flipped to a blank page and right in the center of the blank page, there is this very small but obviously written don't stop. Hmm. And I, that day, I really needed it. Those moments do happen. I really, really needed it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, cause you're, you're in the midst of doing something mundane, like collecting email addresses to put on your email list, blah, blah, blah. And you flip through and you go, oh, someone, someone wrote this and they didn't want me to stop. And there's other moments of, there's other examples of like, of that in this book specifically, but it's also, you know, like whenever I, we get, um, like a review of the podcast on iTunes, usually there's some really good stuff. Like, I'm so glad we listen. We got to hear so-and-so story about X, Y, Z because of it helped me do this other thing that I'm doing right now. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that I, that really keep me going. And I, And I started a practice of putting all of it in a feel good folder. Yeah. And it's like a, I have it a feel good folder, like a label and Gmail, but I also have it as a note in my phone as well. So, I mean, I can add something to it. Like, you know, somebody's simply saying, I really enjoyed one song specifically about, you know, my niece who I just, who was just born or, they really appreciated one particular line. And those are the comments that I like really love. You know, I've, I've learned that whenever somebody says, Hey, good job tonight, or thank you for performing. My response is thank you. And what spoke to you most, because that answer to the, what spoke to you most is the thing that I keep a hold on. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it tells me that I'm said the right thing, or I connected with something beyond just good job tonight. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I think this is a really important, I've wanted to point this out to you for a long time. And this is what's really necessary in the arts. You are, have been wonderful in both your, in all of the work that you do is building this relationship to the viewer, the listener, to the work beyond just the, the thing, you know, and the thing has become, has been a commodity for a long time. Mm-hmm. It is thought about in terms of our capitalist economic situation, culture, and and you've created something that that is that resonates beyond that. It's, I mean, I think about it in terms of this kind of Taoist idea that it'll say like uh, one plus one. Normally, we think equals two, but 
the, the, but the one and the one equals three. So it's like the beyond, there's something that goes beyond Mm -hmm. just that, that exchange. And, and, and I think that it's really essential that we're working to connect more deeply around the work, work that's being made, building relationship, inspiring others to find more deeply within themselves, whatever it is that they're going to go and move forward with in terms of the work that they're doing. And and rather than art continuing to be this removed thing that we pay money for and we go and we see or we listen to or we watch and then it's set aside. I mean, I think there's been a better relationship with music mm-hmm. than may, maybe say performing arts and because people can really continue a relationship with there more easily, right? They can buy music and have it there in their library and listen to it all the time. And it means a lot to them more deeply, but, and maybe you have thoughts where it's, it's not going well. And that's why you're so active in building this deeper, more relational aspect and, and inspiring others to see themselves, not so much, yes, sometimes in specifically in the work, but but beyond the work and how, like I just said, move out into their own lives and do what they're doing. And I think that's really, really important. And even though for me, I I still feel small, (laughs) very small, I continue to be driven by this idea that, as I've said, like this dance company is more than a dance company. It's, it's a way of life. And, and for me, it's built around this philosophy that movement is how we connect more deeply with ourselves, more deeply with one another, more deeply with the world around us, the environment um, that we live, move through and from and within. And not only that, but well, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> I had one more thing to say, but I think I need to let you speak. I'll jump in and just say that, you know, I wanted to have you on the show because I know that both of us struggle with these same things. And, you know, you're talking about how this like depressive struggle for meaning or value, or where am I supposed to go with this stuff next? Like I struggle with that stuff actively myself. And it's, I don't think that, you know, I don't think we need to overcome it. I think there's this, there's, as artists, we get the opportunity to use it, but there is that delicate balance between what is, you know, like, yeah, I can use this struggle. I can use this pain. I can use these questions, um, to create something, but I also just want a happy, wonderful, loving life Uh and it's okay. I have had to have my own, like, okay, let's put, let's take a break. And just take a deep breather and go, okay, yeah, I live in a great place. Mm. I have community. I ha- like remind, you have to take a break to remind yourself that <sighs> diving back into the struggle is a choice yeah. and it's a worthy choice, but so is not diving back into it. So yeah. Well, and I, there's more, one more thing to add to that, that actually I think it's really important to say, you know, for a lot of the questioning for me too, was the question of privilege and there's a lot I could say around the depression, but the the one area that I think was appropriate was to question, you know, does the world need another white woman making dance, you know, and, and why does it matter for me to make dance? And, and not just a white woman, but a cisgendered and hetero. And I mean, just all those things that I think are, are really appropriate to, to ask yourself. And, and especially in this time when finally the lid has come off that, uh, structures exist that are still harming people in this country. So that was a lot of questioning, you know, and what is the work that I'm meant to make and do? And certainly I made a lot more work since the box house we at that time. But, um, <laughs> and then there's more to come. But that was, that was a deep question too. And, and so I think we, Emily, we have, we, I went to college and studied dance. <laughs> that's a, that's a huge privilege because of my background. And, and so, at a graduate level yeah, too, right? At a graduate level, although I thankfully got a full ride because I wasn't going to go to graduate school on on debt or or paying money, you know, just to go to graduate school because I could go to graduate school because I don't necessarily think that that is necessary as an artist is to go to graduate school. So I I just yeah, there's just a lot of pain too of wanting to be a, an ally to problems and for others that in this world and wanting to make work that that is, is doing something that is making change. And, and I, I, I just really questioned at times, 
did I end up on this path because I had privilege in terms of being in dance, right? Or even, I mean, as simple as how, find, for some reason, the trajectory of my life unfolded with this amazing partner that, you know, 18 years now, marriage isn't easy. It was a journey, but, you know, fortunately that, that is a part of the gift of my life is this amazing partner. And there are other people trying to make art that you are doing it on your own without a partner who I'm not saying that it is like being, uh, please nobody hear me wrong. I'm, it's not like eating bonbons. Like there's some man making, helping me do this. I mean, dang, we lived off of nothing for years and years and years. And we're still five people with a teenager in two bedrooms, you know? So, um, but he was committed to what he believed in me, um, and helped me continue to believe in myself, which was doing this art. But some people don't have that privilege. I mean, we can even go beyond this country and women are walking, women and girls are still walking three miles in two direction, both ways to collect water. By the way, the Gates Foundation has a wonderful exhibit up on uh, half the sky right now, which was uh, part of an influence of a work I created in 2016 about injustice toward the female body and toward the earth. So it's an area I really am passionate about, but, um, but yeah, so that's that I had to interject that before I said, you know, before we were done today, that's just really important for us wet folks and um, all the other things I mentioned to really ask. I'm right there with you. What are we doing with the gifts we've been given and the privilege that we have in the arts? And if you guys are curious about some more of that conversation, um, Andy Zook and I talked about advocacy in art and kind of how to, how to put yourself out there knowing that you might be wrong Mm. (laughs) and still listen to the response and still be able to like with an open heart and an open mind, listen to the response. Great. I can't wait to go listen to that one. I missed that one. Yeah. It's from 57 episode 57. It was a good conversation. And I just, before we wrap up, I want to ask you what you're working on right now. Yeah. Well, as always, it's all, everything, I, I keep thinking to myself, will a project feel like there's no risk? <laughs> but I think that's why we, I think that's the purpose of this. Is we, so I'm working on a project for years and years. I've always had this commitment to live local new music in Seattle. And I had thought it carried, you know, the, the, the burden of paying for live music and then the struggle of knowing that that money could go toward more toward the dancers and they always get the short end of the stick in all the arts. And so I thought, wouldn't that be amazing to find a music group that had, was like-minded that wanted to partner. And lo and behold, just a year ago in the fall, um, last fall, October, I met Brian Chin of the universal language project. We'd been <laughs> running circles around each other for years, uh, producing <laughs> collaborative interdisciplinary work. And he had wanted to find a dance group to partner with. And he had gone through some routes to find that and didn't work out. And eventually we found each other. So we're producing our first show together coming up here in December. And, you know, I say risk. This was something he already had on the dock. And you can go and read about it. I won't say more because I know we need to end this. But uh, we, ha- we had a brand new libretto. We commissioned a brand new libretto for it, for a uh, Stravinsky work that had, was written a- almost 100 years ago. And we wanted this to deal with the geopolitical, environmental, economic issues of the last 100 years and really specifically digging into where we're at today. And so, and I get to play the protagonist. The original was a, was a man, the protagonist. and. Anyways, I'm really excited about it. I'm also somewhat terrified at the risk of, you know, wanting to produce something that's really good. And we're trying out a bunch of new things and we still don't have the biggest budgets in the world on both sides, but I'm thrilled to be working with these people. I think that's one thing that I'm, I'm joyful about that has changed. You, in our first early part of the conversation, we talked about, you know, loneliness and sequestering and working on our own. And and now I have uh, more, there are more people around me and this gift of working with people on the collaborative level on ideas and, and really, truly, I mean, we throw the word collaboration around a lot and there are certain things that really, truly make something a collaboration. And I finally, finally feel that I'm working on a true collaborative thing going on here right now. And so there's that. And I'm going to Guatemala to perform a solo with this Dance Forms Productions International Showcase. That was kind of a magical thing. She started sending me invitations to apply. I don't know how she found me. I can't wait to meet her in person. 
And um, so I'm, I'm doing the solo, actually. This is a cool story. Uh, so really quickly, I'm doing a solo that was from that work I mentioned that was inspired by the book Half the Sky, the book The Locust Effect, and the book um, Infidel, and about women and injustice. And I, for some reason, felt strongly pulled to apply to this Guatemala one. And I immediately was accepted with this solo. And it's a very intense solo. It's disturbing, but effective as described by Omar Willie of the Seattle Star in a review. And um, I said to her after, I'm like, are you sure you watched it? Because it's pretty disturbing. And um, But I realized after I accepted it, because I couldn't explain the poll to apply particularly to this one, because she does it all over the world, um, Scotland. and I can't remember all the different places. But I realized that the opening story, I believe it's in The Locust Effect, is about a very serious, very, very disturbing story about um, a girl in Guatemala. So um, that's a really exciting connection, you know, for me. I'm so excited. (laughs) Thanks. And of course there's more to come in 2018. I'm working on a big water project, uh, dealing with climate change. And we have a meeting today uh, with an installation artist, Roger Feldman and a scientist and and my team, a composer and costume designer. So Mm. we're hoping to see that happen in 2018. Although it's, this one's massive. And that's another thing is sometimes you follow these projects and you just don't know exactly. I think we live in a society. It's like, you want to have everything figured out. What are your goals? You know, and how are you going to get from A to B to C? But when you make art, there are just so many boundaries that you cannot, you, you, you just, I think it would be a good lesson for our politicians and our you know, business leaders. There is some level of the dance that's appropriate and necessary. It builds humility. It builds respect to hear other sides and, yeah. and to work with small means financially. And, and maybe there'd be less waste you know? So Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So hopefully it'll be good. The stuff coming, (laughs) but we're, but being faithful to the work is what's important. It's true. And I think that that's one of the things that I admire about you is you are very faithful to the work. You are very diligent about collaboration and you're also very diligent about revealing what it's like the process Hmm. of behind the scenes. So that's thanks to my husband. Michael's asked me to consider revealing the process more and more. I don't, I don't know if there's more revealing that I can do, but I'm that's nice to hear you acknowledge that. Totally. I think it's great. And if you guys are curious about what I'm talking about, you can go check out her website at karnstevensdance.com. Yeah. And that link's going to be in the show notes for the episode as well. So you can go to barenakedbravery.com if you want to learn how to spell that. <laughs> but it's Karin with an I, K-A-R-I-N. Karin, thank you so much for joining us today. I am so grateful that you were able to join. Well, first of all, be here, but then also be here with your whole self. So thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you for having this podcast about bravery and creativity, because I truly believe we're all meant to move and create from that movement. And it takes bravery. It takes courage. It takes heart. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so glad Karen got to join us for that conversation. And please know that she and I are already working on carving out some more time to make a follow-up episode for you guys. In the meantime, though, your brave takeaway from today's episode is to hop into the Bare Naked Bravery community group and tell us all about your own dark night of the soul. I know that we all have one. I have one. I have a couple I can actually point to. I know that we could use a little magic and seeds of wisdom from each other in this regard. So please share with us some of the ways that you found your way back to purpose, meaning living and making an art in a really brave way. That Facebook group is such a wealth of resources and people who are out there doing the same things you are. So take advantage of it. You can join, if you're not already a member, you can join by visiting barenakedbravery.com and downloading a bravery bundle for free, and you will get a link to join along with that bundle. So all of the other links that we mentioned in today's episode are at barenakedbravery.com in today's episode's show notes. So just search for Karen Stevens, K-R-I-N Stevens with a V, and Karen's beautiful face will pop right up. If you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it for you, then I encourage you to leave a rating and review in your Apple podcast app 
or send this episode to a friend who you think would enjoy listening to it. That's the way all of this bravery gets spread around the world. And we all appreciate it because we really do need rare naked bravery. Beyond that, I want to thank Lee Rosevier, who is our music represented musician in today's episode. Thank you, Lee, for letting us use your music as a, a wonderful resource for this show and our community. Beyond that, I am just looking forward to being with you next week. We have some really awesome things in store for you. And until then, I have one message for you. It's this, be yourself, be vulnerable, be imaginative, be improvisational, and be brave because the world needs more of your bare naked bravery. 